So today is uh, October 2nd. It is 2016. You have arrived, if you are a guest here or a member, makes no difference. You have arrived at the ordination of Brent Vincent. This is the very reason this church was formed. We wanted to see lives like Brent and Teresa formed into a tool in the hand of God. So I want to read you a letter that we are presenting them. And then there will be a uh, message from the pastors that are on the stage. Congratulations, Brent, Teresa. Today is your ordination day. At some point before time began, the living God purposed in his heart that he would use men like you to complete the body of the Lamb that was to be slain. Angels have longed to look into this plan, and they've been denied access. But you have been given both access and participation. As you participate in his plan, we know that you and Teresa will continue to be pleasing to the Lord in an ever-increasing measure. We admire the way that the Vincent family is tenacious in obeying Jesus, and we stand in awe of the Spirit's power within you. Today, men are acknowledging that they recognize the calling that God has always had on your life. Figuratively, you're in the polishing stream along with many other stones. But by the grace of God, you have been selected for a specific task. Even as David chose five smooth stones... So has Jesus chosen you. Stay close to the chief shepherd and continue to be shaped by him so that you will fly straight and slay that giant. As Moses told Joshua, we now remind you, rock Kazakamats, be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Our shared hope is that we will obtain a better resurrection by presenting others to Yahweh as the fruit of His labor in us. Remember that your first presentation of fruit is your own family. You, like Abraham, have been chosen to direct your children and household after the Lord to keep His way by doing what is right. As your blood brothers, by the blood of Jesus, we pledge our love and support to you as you carry out your God-given task. We recognize God's ordination on your life, and we are thrilled to be a part of what Yahweh is doing in your life. As we continue in the work of the Lord, make it your goal to be concerned only with Him who enlisted you as a soldier. Refuse to be concerned with the affairs of civilians. Instead, carry out the chief shepherd's orders. We are confident that as our shepherd's appearing nears, you will remain one of his brightest stars. This was written by your friends and fellow servants of the One Association churches. I added a quote to it that I think is fitting for you guys. This was written by a man named C.T. Studd. And it's fitting, Brent. You've become a stud. Too long have we been waiting for one another to begin. The time of waiting is now past. The hour of God has, has struck. War is declared. In God's holy name, let us arise and build. The God of heaven, he will fight for us as we for him. We will not build on sand, but on the bedrock sayings of Christ. And the gates and the minions of hell shall not prevail against us. Should such men as we fear, before the world, I before the sleepy, lukewarm, faithless, namby-pamby Christian world, we will dare to trust our God. We will venture our all for Him. We will live and we will die for Him. And we will do it with His joy unspeakable, singing aloud in our hearts. 
We will a thousand times sooner die trusting only our God than live trusting in man. And when we've come to this glorious position, the battle is already won and the end of the campaign is in sight. We will have the real holiness of God, not the sickly stuff of talk and dainty words and pretty thoughts. We will have a masculine holiness, one of daring faith in works for Jesus Christ. Our prayer for you is that every word of that continue to be exemplified in your life as we have seen it to this point. Our pastors are now going to walk us through a selection process a qualification process, and an implementation. We're going to do it from the Word. You will hear the law, the prophets, and the writings. You will hear it from pastors that have been raised up and sent out and pastors that are raising up and sending out because we together affirm the great call of God on your life. Pastor Matthew, would you step forward? Turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 8. Say there when you are there. There you go, loud and proud. There. <laughs> what I'm going to cover with you beginning here in Numbers 8 is a selection process that the Lord does and it has and how it has a familial tied to it, meaning that how he makes us family in that selection process. And there's a deep importance in that familial tie because this is more than just an association of people of like mind or like dress or like hobbies. What sits in this room, for those of you who are in love with Jesus, sold out and born again, is that we are selected by the King of Kings to be the family of God. Amen? Now, can you say without a shadow of a doubt that Brent Vincent, along with his family, has been selected by God to be at this church, Amen. and very soon, in a few days, then to go to Indonesia? Amen? Amen? So with that thought in mind, let's start in verse 5 of chapter 8. The Lord said to Moses, take the Levites from among the other Israelites and make them ceremonially clean. Now, I had the wonderful pleasure are participating in one of the first events that was a mandate given to the Vincent family in order for them to come to a mission trip with us to Mexico. You know, even at Six Flags over wherever, there's an admission price. So how much more with the things of God that there's also a price to pay? And the very first thing that was mandated to Brent Vincent was, if you want to come with us to Mexico, we need to know that you're serious. So you are currently living in Lafayette, Louisiana, 315 miles or so from Houston. And we want you to drive, you and your whole family, on a Sunday morning prior to the Mexico trip and come and meet us here. And when Brinson, Brent Vincent did that, it began to show a seriousness and a commitment that he was willing to be selected to be a part of what we were doing. Well, then ensued the Mexico trip, and we're riding in my Ford F-350, and I have Brent, Teresa, Brenton, and Abby, their oldest children. And not 15 minutes after we crossed the border, we were selected by the Mexican cartel. They pulled us over. Of course, I didn't know that until the truck pulled in front of mine, and out came two men with AK-47s. Well, they brought out their weaponry, but I want to let you know, right then and there, the metal of the Vincent family was tested. And for a split second, I, I wondered in my mind, what is this man and his wife and children going to do? Uh, I'm going to pray in tongues until these guys just move. But what are these guys going to do? And without skipping a beat, we were all shouting at the top of our lungs in that truck in tongues, calling down the name of Jesus. And as you can see, we still made it back home safe and sound. Amen. I knew from that day that long uh, car ride from Houston to Matamoros and back, that these guys were handpicked by the Lord to be a part of us, and part of us for a reason. So let's continue on. Number one, we identify that God chose them. Secondly, in verse 7, to purify them. Do this, sprinkle the water of cleansing on them, then have them shave their whole bodies and wash their clothes, and so purify themselves. 
So Brent, we're not going to ask you right now to shave your body. Amen. Everybody else can say amen to that. Yeah, there we go. Bear witness to that. But the purification process is a removal of what doesn't belong. And in doing so in a, in a believer's life, hardships are the main course of the meal. So what we had the opportunities over the past uh, six, seven years is watch the Vincent family and Brent as their head go through hardship after hardship of God purifying and refining, purifying and refining. It's like watching a blacksmith take iron and heat it in a furnace and then pound it out, heat it in a furnace and pound it out until it's shaped into something that is beginning to take form of what the master is going to use in his hand. And what we have before us is a man's life along with his family's that has been purified by the will of God. Everybody can say amen to that. Amen. amen. Let's pick up in verse 12. After the Levites lay their hands on the heads of the bulls, use the one for a sin offering to the Lord and the other for a burnt offering to make atonement for the Levites. What this next phase is sacrifice. Well, in that purification process, it allows you then to make right sacrifice before the Lord. And what we begin to see in the past year and a half or so is Brent sacrifice rent houses, sacrifice their, their own home, putting it on the market. Sacrifice even the treasure things that they have for each one individually, for Abby, a ukulele, for Brent, a car. And as they lay these things before the Lord and is consumed in the fire of his presence out of their obedience, it then further verifies that they have been selected by the Lord. Amen. And so the Lord is going to use them to then go to the next, next part of where I'm going. So verse 15, let's read this. After you have purified the Levites and presented them as a wave offering, they are to come to do their work at the tent of meeting. Everybody say, do the work. Do the work. We have this as a, a mantra, as a saying of vision for our church. But a wave offering would be taken by the priest and in celebration and thanksgiving, wave it before the Lord. You know what we're doing here today and will continue to do? We will wave the Vincents before the Lord as an offering that is holy and acceptable before God. And we will rejoice in the good things that he's entrusted to us, and now we are entrusting to the work in Indonesia. The offering itself, as seen in verse 11, was an offering from the people by Aaron to the Lord. So we'll break this down a little bit further. The Vincents are an offering from us, from LCMS, LCMF, everybody say us. us. By Aaron, Jesus is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, not of Aaron, but standing in the same place. So we are taking the Vincents, we are giving them to Jesus, and what Jesus is going to do is use them before the Lord for his work. Amen? Amen. 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 Next, we substitute for the firstborn with the Levites. Let's read verse 18. And I have taken the Levites in place of all the firstborn sons in Israel. Saints, whenever the Vincents land and their feet touch Indonesian soil for the first time as they set their, their tents and houses up there, they are a representation of us in that work. Whenever Brent, Vincent, Teresa, or their children advance the kingdom of God, that is life-changing ministries advancing the kingdom of God in India, I mean, in Indonesia. So how important is it that not only we celebrate today in what God is about to do, and much more, we need to continue to support these guys as they further the work that God is doing from us through them. Amen? Amen. Next, Levites are a gift to Aaron and his sons to do the work in the tent of meeting. Joy, pull up 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20. David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous. Everyone say, rock kazak. Rock kazak. That sounds like a really good line to a song in the 80s. And do the work. Everybody say, do the work. Do the work. Amen. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work of the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Brent, a charge from me personally to you is, number one, 
Don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. We know that word discouraged means to be terrified and broken to pieces. I can tell you as a man of God who has stood with my brothers, scratching and clawing the earth to build a church of believers that love them with all his heart, you're going, to over, you're going to face many, many challenges that are going to try to break you into many pieces. Stay connected with the body of Christ. Don't be afraid to discourage, but instead rise up in strength and courage that he has given you today and that he will give you then. And don't ever stop until it is finished. Plow, plow, plow until that work is done. Lastly, what doing the work enables our hearts to do with the Vincent family is to unite in a familial way because we are brothers. You know that brothers have similar characteristics from each other, but in the same way they, they replicate the image of their father. Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 48 through 50. Let me encourage all of you who are witnessing this ready, set, go time of the Vincents. That when you set out to do something for Jesus, you know, those that you think should support you and should, enc should encourage you the most will be those closest to you. Well, I can tell you here in this body, we absolutely will. But particularly for family members, you also anticipate that to be there. And I can guarantee you, there will be those that you think should and you expect it and they don't. Jesus is thriving in his ministry. He's beginning to demonstrate who he is with miracles, with power, with teaching and authority no one has ever seen. And his mother with brothers and sisters. All you Catholics take notice of that. His mother and his family came to take charge of him because they thought he was out of his mind. I can tell you, when you go to do the will of God, there will be those that you expect to support you, and they think that you are crazy. Expect it to be there. And set your hearts on these verses, 48 through 50. He replied to them, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and, he, and my brothers. So, Brent Vincent, in your heart, remember this day. You point to everyone in this room who has loved you, supported you, been with you. We are your brothers. We are your sisters and your mothers and fathers in this place. And the, the last verse rings true. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I, I can say, brother, it's an honor to be in the family of God with you. It's an honor to have witnessed the work of God that you are doing and that you will do. And absolutely, we stand with you, brother. Amen. Amen. Man, I'm fired up now. <laughs> we are family. <laughs> Pastor Matt uh, talked about the selection process from Numbers 8. I'd like to talk about the qualification process from Leviticus 8. So if you turn to Leviticus 8 for me, we're going to start there. <clears throat> we can think of a lot of things in the New Testament that give us qualifications. You can read through Timothy, you can read through Titus and find certain qualifications for ministers. But we're going to go back, being the church that we are, we're going to go back and see what the original qualifications were. We're going to find the roots here in the Older Testament. Leviticus chapter 8, say there when you're there. there. We're going to start in verse 5. It says this, Moses said to the assembly, this is what the Lord has commanded to be done. Everybody say commanded. commanded. These are not suggestions. These are not good ideas that you might want to think about. These are commandments from the Lord on high. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them with water. Pastor Matt did a great job of talking about that purification process that the fiery trials help to purify us. This is also hinting at that and showing us that same principle yet again. Verse 7, he put the tunic on Aaron, tied the sash around him, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him. Everybody say ephod. Ephod, ephod is a priestly garment. This is not a normal garment. This is not something that people walk around daily with. This is something that is set aside for the priestly contingent. And we'll look here, and we're going to find a very interesting thing. It's just one ephod. Everybody say one ephod. one ephod. But there are three parts that we're going to look at. We've got one ephod, 
in three parts. Let's take a look at verse 7. He put the tunic on Aaron, tied the sash around him, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him. He also tied the ephod to him by its skillfully woven waistband so that it was fastened on him. He placed the breast piece on him and put the Urim and the Thummim in the breast piece. Then he placed the turban on Aaron's head and set the gold plate, the sacred diadem on front of it, as the Lord commanded Moses. Do you see these three parts? They're the waistband. They're the breast piece. And they're a turban. Would you, turn, would you keep your place here and turn to Ephesians chapter 6 with me? Ephesians chapter 6. Buddy Brasso did a great job of teaching on this a few weeks ago, a few Friday nights ago, on the armor of God. I'm going to tell you something. After the more that I've considered it, uh, as I was thinking today, I actually got a little mad. I don't know why I got so mad, Brent, Teresa. I was thinking about this passage, and we're going to read it here in just a second. But we're going to see what the Lord really intended for this. Ephesians chapter 6, let's read verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Brent, Teresa, there's going to be many times where you're going to have to remember it's not the people that you're looking at. You have to deal with them, but the struggle is against the principalities and the powers, the rulers, the authorities of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, not questioning if the day of evil comes, it is a declaration. When it comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Whew. One of our biggest prayers for you as I pray for you daily, as our family prays for you, Lord, let them stand firm. Let them stand their ground as you take ground in the spiritual realm. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And the breastplate of righteousness in place. And then skip down to verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Folks, uh, I have been told all my life, I've grown up in church, and I've been told that this model was modeled after Roman guards. The Roman armor. Why in the world would a Hebrew book written by Hebrews, to the Hebrews, that has since gotten out to the world, model everything that they do after someone else besides their own people. This belt of truth, this breastplate of righteousness, and this helmet of salvation. Turn back to, to Leviticus chapter 8. He also tied the ephod to him by its skillfully woven waistband. Does that sound like a belt of truth to you? It does to me. I can imagine that Paul was sitting there, and as he's thinking about it, he's not thinking about a Roman guard. He's thinking about the very priesthood of God. Of course he's thinking about the men that he would see over and over and over again, those who were charged to be the power of God on this earth. That's who Paul was thinking about, and we can see it here. The belt of truth. Verse 8, he placed on them the breast piece and put the Urim and the Thummim. Hold your place here and turn to Exodus chapter 28. Are you guys with me this morning? Yeah. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 30. Uh, let's go back to verse 29. Exodus 28, 29. Is everybody there? Yeah. Good, because you're going to want to see this. You're not going to want to miss this this morning. Whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the son of Israel. Where? Over his heart. On the, breast piece, on the breast piece of decision as a continuing memorial before the Lord. You know it's a continual memorial? When we have a breast piece of righteousness. When our acts of righteousness that are over our heart. You know why we do what we do? Because we've got God's righteousness that rests upon our heart. Look at verse 30. Also put the Urim and the Thummim in the breast piece so that they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. You know what you can't do? You cannot enter into God's presence unless you walk in holiness, unless you walk in righteousness that covers you. Thus, Aaron will always bear the means of making decisions. Our world is terrible at making decisions. 
So many believers have no idea what they're supposed to do. I can assure you, when you walk in righteousness, you will have God's presence right over your heart, and you will be able to make the decisions that you need to make. Amen. The Vincents are going to walk in righteousness. They're going to have their waist. They're going to be held together by the very power of truth. They're going to get so much in the word they already have. That's marked their life. They will continue to do so, and you know what it does? It holds you together. You know what it does? You have the acts of righteousness that are upon you. And back, it talks about, uh, in, back in Leviticus Verse 9, it says, Then he placed the turban on Aaron's head and set the gold plate, <laughs> the plate that declared the holiness of our Lord, the sacred diadem on front of it as the Lord had commanded. Sounds like a helmet of salvation to me. A divine, the divinity, the gold that speaks there. It reminds us of his holiness. It reminds us of his godliness. And it covers our mind. It protects our mind. It's almost like God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. <laughs> Folks, anything that you read in the New Testament, we will preach this. We have preached it. We will continue to preach it. Anything in the New Testament that you love, there is an Old Testament origin to it. Don't think that they've skipped out. They are exactly thinking these things that we are reading today. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59. Look at verse 17. 59, 17. <clears throat> says this, he put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. Again, folks, this is Older Testament, right? We see it from the law. We're seeing it from the prophets that this is what we are supposed to be wearing. This is the full armor that we put on. Paul listed it for us in a nice fashion, but this is screaming to us. It's declaring from, from all the way back to the beginning. It's declaring that this is God's plan for us, to be held together with truth, to walk in righteousness because it protects our heart, and to have our minds guarded by the helmet of salvation. I, don't, you, I, I am excited about this, and you don't seem to be as excited as I am, and that's okay. I'm still excited. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <laughs> Don't let my hoarseness of voice think that I'm not with us here today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And let's read verse 5. You are all sons of the light. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. You are all sons of the light. And sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Let's look in verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a what? Breastplate. As a breastplate. And the hope of salvation as a what? Belt. Well, where's the belt of truth? Let's take a look. Let's read verse 8 again. But since we belong to the day. You know what belonging to the day means? The only way that you can belong to the day is if you're walking in the light. The only way that you can walk in the light is to be walking in his truth. You have the belt of truth. You have the breastplate of righteousness and faith and love. Your actions, your deeds that prove what your heart really is. God knows my heart. Well, of course he does. Because he's going to watch your actions. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to preach myself happy today. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. Let's start in verse 22. And Brent and Teresa, this is designed for you. We love you. We watch you walk and your lives are being held together. They're going to be held even more together by truth in the upcoming days. That your hearts are going to be protected. That you will not become faint-hearted because you're going to have his acts of righteousness. You're not going to have... A difficult time knowing what his will is because your, your minds will be guarded by the very helmet, <laughs> the very turban of his salvation. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. <laughs> I'll get you the turban there instead of the helmet. Verse 22 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, 
which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind. So before we went uh, waistband, we went the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and the helmet of salvation. Now we're just going to do it in the opposite direction. right? Let's look at the verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, like Philippians 2 encourages us. And to put on the new self created to be like God in what? True righteousness and holiness. That breastplate that comes back again. Look at verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbors. For we are all members of one body. Um, Do you see it over and over again? Do you see that the principle that was guarded in the priest of what God commanded them? Do you see how it resonates throughout? Let me encourage you, body of Christ. We have now become a kingdom of priests. This is not only for the Vincents this morning, but is your life bound together by truth? Are your actions so righteous that they provide a shield over your very heart? Is your mind so clear because you have the helmet of salvation and you wear it properly? This is supposed to be what marks our lives collectively, and especially those who are called according to God's plan especially those who are in the priesthood, but it does not exclude you, my friends. To think that this is only a, a five-fold ministry obligation, I can assure you, that's never what this word is about. It has to be especially true for us, but it must be true for you as well. Let's turn back to Leviticus chapter 8. These garments were precious. They were made with the finest of linen. They were handcrafted by the most skillful of craftsmen. And we see through there's also sacrifices that are involved, just like we saw in Numbers chapter 8. Let's start in verse 23. Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of the blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear. Everybody say right ear. On the thumb of his right hand. Everybody say thumb of the right hand. Thumb of the right hand. And on the big toe of the right foot. Everybody say right foot. right foot. Okay, everybody raise your right hand. Yeah, this is the right hand. I'm looking at you, so it's over here, right? Everybody, grab your right earlobe. Give me a thumbs up. And everybody wiggle your big toe with your right foot. What in the world is God doing here? Can you imagine? This is not just this, folks. We have anointing oil. It's special. It's precious. I'm going to get to the oil in just a second. But he did not ask. He did not instruct Moses to go around and say, here's some water. Dab it on their ear. Here's, here's something else. What, what, was, what was this passage saying? Moses slaughtered, slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood and began anointing these places. If you think that you're ever going to do anything for the Lord, if you're going to think that you can proclaim yourself even in the kingdom and there not be a sacrifice that costs you your life, you've been deceived. To have a true sacrifice before the Lord, it always requires blood. Everybody grab your right earlobe. Hey, Brent, uh, you can let go just for a second. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Right-handed. Amen. You know what that means? It means his strongest arm, the dominant hand, what he feels most comfortable and most powerful using is his right hand. Grab your elo. You know what's really powerful is when God anoints our ear that we can hear his voice. You cannot hear his voice unless the blood has been applied to your ear. You can't even think about it. I can't hear the Lord. It's because you haven't had your ear anointed with the blood. Give me, give me a thumbs up that your actions, that everything that you do, that the very strength of your life has to be covered in the blood or it's of no effect in the kingdom. And your toe, wiggle your toe. Can't see you, so I gotta trust you. That everywhere that you go, that God is leading. We know that the Vincents, that God is leading. We know that they're a family. But take a look at this. Back to verse 23. Who is this? Who is this talking about? Moses slaughtered and put it on whom? On Aaron, look at verse 24. This is not designed just to be a singular person that does these things. 
It's not only the exalted and the high. What it is is Moses also brought Aaron's son forward and put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. What this is going to happen in the Vincents, what you've seen happen here in this church, is that it starts with a man. <laughs> but it doesn't just end there. That's right. The whole design is that this thing is multiplied out generation after generation. Not only our progeny, not only our children, but those that we bring in. Abraham was chosen because he would lead his children and his household. Amen. What you're going to see in the Vincents is they're leading their children. And they're going to be building this household there in Indonesia. People will come in and what they're going to do is say, you must, be, you must have the blood applied to your hearing. You must have it applied to your actions. You must have it applied to your direction. Let me encourage you in this because I am trying to drill this point home. Our helmet of salvation can cover. It covers our ears so that what we hear is appropriate from the heavens. This breastplate of righteousness that talks about our actions and this toe that is directed by the very spirit of truth. It walks before us. Let's take a look at verse 30. Leviticus 8 and verse 30. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood from the altar and sprinkled them on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and on their garments. <laughs> You know what happens after you get the blood properly applied to your hearing, to your actions, and to where you go? Then you're ready for the anointing oil. You're ready for his spirit to come in and do something powerful, but you can't get this out of order. You can't decide that you want the oil first without the sacrifice that's required. You can't do this out of order. God will never allow it to be that way. We see this in the Vincents. We've seen a life that has been covered and dedicated to the blood, and we see an anointing on them. <laughs> what about you? We're celebrating the Vincents today, but what about you? Can you say that you've literally been covered, that other people can see? Because you know what today is? As Pastor Eric read it so skillfully, so skillfully worded, that we are recognizing what is already upon the Vincents. An ordination service from our point of view is we, we are saying, yes, Lord, we see that you have chosen this man. Yes, Lord, we see that you have chosen his family, and we affirm it with everything because we, like them, have been also called and chosen. And so we know exactly what it's like. This is the anointing, this blood and this oil. This blood and this oil in that fashion. There's a salvation and there's a filling with the Spirit. This is what happens in the kingdom, that there's always the blood the blood that's required in the sacrifice, and then the oil that flows sometimes even from our own crushing. But this is how the pure oil is produced. It's produced for light. It's produced for fragrance. It's produced for anointing. It's produced for healing. It is produced for many, many things, always as a result of the crushing. This blood and this oil, I just want to encourage you today. <laughs> Vincent, we love you. We acknowledge the powerful hand of God upon you, and our prayer is that his blood will always cover your ears, that his blood will always be in your powerful right hand, that his blood will always be leading your step, and you will be anointed in each of those areas beyond words, beyond belief. Can you hear me? With which ear? Will you work with me? With which hand? Will you go with me? Yeah, but what foot will lead you? The order in Christianity is blood, then oil. We encounter the bloody crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That becomes important to us when we have a sentence of death in our hearts. And then the anointing of God comes into you, and you're enlivened for the first time, truly. We go from the death of this world to the life of God. And then we re-enter death in a new way. I want to show you that. Turn with me to 1 Samuel. When you get to 1 Samuel, find the sixth chapter. I'm going to summarize the fifth. Our brothers have shared with us about 
selection, and qualification. Another way to summarize that is you were once trapped in the temple of a foreign god. But the presence of God broke his head and his hands off. And now you have been set free. This brings us to 1 Samuel 6. I love the Vincents. I think my love grew for them exponentially, not just after the mission trip that Matthew spoke about. That was pretty stellar. He left out a small detail. I told Brent that he had to come, and I had to meet his family before they went to Mexico, and then I forgot the day on which he was coming. Preached two hours, and afterwards saw a new family and said, y'all want to grab some lunch? And he said, sure. Talked to him for a couple hours, and he said, so... Uh, what do you think about Mexico? What do you mean, what do I think about Mexico? I love it. I go all of the time. He said, yeah, I, I wouldn't know if we could go with you. I said, wow, that was you? That was you that called? <laughs> the kingdom requires patience. I don't just love them for that. There was a particular time when Brent heard from God and he took his stand. And... Uh, it was at the birth of one of their children. They decided to have a home birth. And that's become, become fashionable these days. And I don't want to pick on any of you, but I don't believe that Brent did it because he has some inward desire to be a hippie. Uh, and I mean that with all the love that I can possess towards you strange hippies. <laughs> I believe he actually heard from the Lord. And there was also a legitimate physical threat. And we were all praying in the home, and we could feel it. Uh, very, very difficult moments. And I watched the man's faith being forged like iron. Uh, without going into those details, not everybody was as supportive of his plan. But he and the Lord are a majority in any situation. Remember that, Brent. When you've heard from God, that's, that's the only counsel you have to seek. 1 Samuel 6 is something that I think goes to how we implement. Uh, this, this is something that truthfully Pastor Zeke has experienced. The pastors on this stage have experienced. You, you almost have to start a work and scratch it out of the earth to experience what I'm talking about. And um, that may make me qualified to share this. In 1 Samuel 6, let us begin... In say verse 7. Are you there? Yeah. Now go to verse 10. <laughs> so they did this. They took two such cows. Say holy cow. holy cow. Now ease up, mama, on your children. They're doing just fine. These cows are holy to the Lord right here. So they did this. They took two such cows. Don't take it personally, Brent. I waited for Teresa to leave. I'm not calling her anything. I'm calling you a cow. They took two such cows and hitched them to the cart and pinned up their calves. One of the most difficult parts of this process for Brent and Teresa is they don't get to take every one of their offspring to Indonesia. There is always a cost for the gospel. It is always difficult. How fitting that Brent would have to Entrust his firstborn son to the Lord the way that the Lord has entrusted the name of his firstborn son to Brent. That is a beautiful thing. They placed the ark of the Lord on a cart along with it. The chest containing the gold rats and the models of the tumors. Then the cows went straight up. Say straight up. Straight up. I believe that Brent and Teresa will go straight up to Indonesia. They've not wasted any time. They didn't form a committee for 10 years to determine the viability of their campaign. They heard from God, and they have gone straight up. I know a little something about that. The Lord spoke to me on a Friday. Jennifer and I put our finger on a map on a Saturday, and we moved on a Monday. When the Lord speaks to you, waste no time. Like Philip, you run to the chariot. You, you run because you don't know what your window of opportunity is. They went straight up towards Beth Shemesh, keeping on the road, lowing all of the way. Don't be silent, Brent. 
in the face of a church that has become silent, the lion of the tribe of Judah that has had its teeth pulled and its claws removed from its mighty fist. Don't be silent. Share what you know to be true. Share it fearlessly. They did not turn to the right or to the left. Do not leave your mandate, no matter what happens. The biggest strength that you have is that we believe personally, we've seen demonstrated in your character, the strongest testament about you is that you're a stubborn man. And I love it about you. Because stubborn men accomplish the king's work. That's who does it. I'm reminded very often of D.L. Moody's quote, and I'll give it to you and everyone else here. Sir, I don't like your methods of evangelism. He said, I, ma'am, I, I don't like my methods of evangelism either. How do you do it? She said, well, well, I don't. He said, then I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. Stubborn men have always advanced the gospel. If you don't think Paul was stubborn, then ask why his friends were unable to dissuade him from going to Jerusalem. Ask why he fought to get back into an arena in Ephesus. Stubborn men advance the kingdom. Amen, honey? Amen. Is there anything you wanted to share with me today? Oh, amen. She testified publicly. Let that uh, be recorded. Then the cows went straight up towards Beth Shemeth, keeping on the road, lowing all of the way. They did not turn to the right or to the left. The rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the borders of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley. And when they looked up, they saw the ark. They rejoiced at the sight. Brent, I believe that people will rejoice at the sight of your coming. It will be something of wonder to them. You look different. You act different. You dress different. Before this is over, you will be Indonesian. But in the beginning, it's a new and wondrous sight. And why would a man bring his family here? Well, because you're carrying the very presence of God. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. That can't be by mistake that that Hebrew word is Yeshua. And there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cow. Somebody say, holy cow. cow. As a burnt offering to the Lord, the Levites took down the ark of the Lord together in the chest containing the gold objects and placed them on a large rock. On that day, the people of Beshemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The dirty secret of ministry, I'm going to reveal to you publicly in front of everyone today. You carry the very presence of God to a people. You do not turn to the left or the right. You go straight up. You pronounce the entire way. And your very life is the sacrifice that gives them life. You are covered first in the blood of Christ. Then the spirit of Christ that enlivens you. And then you go and you offer the death of your life and your dreams and your desires that they might have life. The way that Paul put this when he was writing to the Corinthians, is in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Starting in the 10th verse, he says, We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive, say we who are alive, are are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us. What is at work in us? Death. death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. The attitude with which you carry forward ministry is as a dead man offering life to the rest of the world. This is the only way that your family survives when you have cleaned up the lives of people by the power of Jesus Christ, when you have shared your all and they use you as a doormat and walk on and forget. This is the only way that you survive in your successes so that you don't think of yourself more highly than you should. It's the only way that you survive in your defeats so that you do not become self-condemning. The truth is, you minister as a dead man. Dead men do not complain. Dead men do not have feelings. Dead men are solely in the hands of the Lord. Brent, we will commend you and your family into the hands of the Lord and you will live as dead men 
that have the life of God in them. I want to encourage you as one pastor to another. Hold fast to the Lord and nothing else. There is no material possession that is worth comparing to the anointing. Resist the temptation to think that you've done something wrong to your children or they have missed out on something. They are experiencing the glory of God. Amen. I can assure you they'll be more alive in the presence of God than they would be sitting on any padded chair. Before I hand this microphone to the venerable reverend Ezekiel Lamb, I have a charge for you from Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. Brent, take refuge in the Lord. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Brent, this is why you sell everything before you go. It's why you are not self-sufficient. It's why you're at the mercy and dependence of the Lord because apart from him, you have no good thing. So you hold fast to him. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. You will live, you will breathe, you will die, sweat, and give blood for the saints that come out of that land. They are the glorious ones. They will use you as a stepladder and stand on your shoulders and feel themselves tall. And that's exactly what Jesus has demonstrated for you. It is a beautiful thing. It is a selfless leadership that will make the name of your king great while yours becomes small. The sorrow of those will increase who run after other gods. I believe, Brent, that you will see a clear distinction between those who serve the demonic, satanic god Allah and his pedophile prophet Muhammad and read that satanic trash called the Koran. Their sorrow will increase. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. I want to encourage you, do not go with the crowd as it goes wrong. Do not adopt their names. Don't participate in syncretism. Don't find new and inventive ways to, to offer the gospel. You stand on what you know to be true. We do not need a new method. We need a new filling of the Holy Ghost. Verse 5. Lord, you have assigned me my portion in my cup. You have made my lot secure. Visas don't make you secure. Finances don't make you secure. Invitations to preach or the fellowship of an association do not make you secure. The Lord makes you secure. When you stand in his will, you stand in all that you need. I know what it is to stand against nearly every other human being because I heard the call of God. It is our goal to stand with you. But you will stand secure when you know that the Lord is proud of you. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Abby and Zoe and Branch, each of the little ones, they will have a delightful inheritance. You do not have to provide for five years down the road. You do not have to plan for 15 years down the road. You have to be obedient to the will of God in this moment and in this time. And every day wake up in that same attitude and say, I cannot be bent. I will not back up. I will not let up. I will not shut up. I must press on. And their inheritance will be as secure as your obedience is true. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Pastor Sutherland has spoken to us about the anointing upon your ears. There is no sweeter thing, no more enlivening thing to the spirit of a man than when his soul is crushed and he has not seen that which he has longed for, but the Lord whispers his counsel into his ear. My own soul has been rewet many a time. I have gone behind church buildings and put my head between my knees and said, Lord, I can't. And he spoke to me and said, you will. And those two words were enough. I know what it is to minister out of a crushed spirit. And I'm telling you, none of us desire it. And it is better for all of us. 
Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Do not give the enemy the satisfaction of watching your knees tremble together. Instead, make him watch you moving forward in the will of God. Do not speak words that would encourage your enemy because he is listening and he is watching and he will fall before you. Therefore, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Brent, you now know the pathway of life. It is not possible for you to back up from it. It is not possible for you to act as if you don't know. You will never again be the same as having embarked on this. A man named Charles Finney said these words, and I want to remind them, you of them, as I welcome Pastor Zeke to share his encouraging word. Revival comes from heaven. When heroic souls enter the conflict, determined to win or die, or if need be, to win and die. I tell you, Vincent, you cannot lose if you walk in the obedience of the Lord. Cast off civilian affairs, take up the command of your king, and give no concern to the thoughts of men. We know where they come from. Pastor. You ever just need to hear the words, you got this? That's much of my intention to stand here today, guys. You got this. We got this. I'm going to speak on uh, implementation. The validation of selection. Matthew talked about selection. Wade talked about qualification. What validates our selection What is evidence that God has qualified us is the implementation of what He's put upon us. Implementation by definition would mean something like this. To put a decision into execution. To execute a decision. And now, having not very many years ago stand on this stage and fought back tears because I was walking through this, Different setting, different geography. I know all of that. Still the same enemy. Still the same battles. A couple years ago, I sat up here fighting back tears because of the scratching that I was doing and how it was wearing on me. This is a, this is a truth I gripped to. When I say grip, what do you guys think of? I mean, you're holding on for dear life. If I really gripped this microphone like I wanted to, I would break it. I mean, it's gripping his truths. It's gripping them and gripping them morning by morning, day by day, gripping these truths. Because he wants to stop us. The enemy wants to stop us. He wants to defeat us. I held to this when I thought about implementation. The fact that when we get to this part of our, um, you know, three parts we're talking about, there's a weight that drops right on your shoulders. It drops right on my shoulders. It's putting to decision. It's putting a decision to execution. But whose decision? Is it your decision? Not according to what my brother preached. God chose you. Brent and Teresa, He chose you. And every day, you'll have to wake up and the executing of God's plan is keeping so ingrained in your mind that this isn't my choice. God handpicked me for this. He handpicked you for this. And every day of your life, starting Tuesday evening, as we navigate through airports, as we do all of that stuff, we're going to remind ourselves, He chose me. 
He chose that whole family, all those beautiful children. He chose you. This is executing his decision. That's a heavier weight, church, don't you think? This isn't something they just dreamed up and thought up. This is the hand of God upon them. Implementation. Go to Psalms chapter 27. And I'm going to start in verse number 7. Psalms 27, verse number 7. Implementation. How do we carry this out? How are we going to make this happen? Verse 7 says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me, answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you. You hear that? He's speaking, when you said, seek my face, my heart says to you, your face, O Lord, it's all I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You've been my help. Has he been your help, brother? That'll that'll never change. That'll never change. He's been our very present help in times of storm. How can we not love him? How can we not trust Him? We must be driven to the kind of faith that will let us do things that cause people to think we're crazy. You know when our loved ones think that we're crazy? Prayerfully, many times it's out of love. And yet nothing trumps the voice of God. Nothing. I'm... I'm getting down to verse number 9. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your anger. I mean, do not turn your servant away in anger. You've been my help. Do not abandon me. Do not forsake me, O God, of my salvation. My father and they mother, man, my mother, they've forsaken me. But the Lord will take me up. But the Lord will take me up. See, it's gripping stuff like that. It's not reading it and passing by it and think, oh, that was a nice scripture. It's gripping this. It's gripping it. But the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a level path because of my foes. Uh, Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversary, for a false uh, witness have risen, risen against me. And such as breathe out violence. Verse 13 and 14 is where I really want us to find our strength. I really want us to find uh, our strength and confidence in a scripture such such as this. And guys, we're going to grip this. We're going to grip it the whole way that we fly there. And I was so excited to get here and look you guys in the eye, look you guys in the eyes, and say, "We're going to do this." This church stands here and says, "We're going to do this." There's not a day you're going to be on your own. We're going to do this. This, these few verses must echo in our minds over and over and over. It's what we grip to. It's what we hold to. It's what carries us through the storm and allows us to come out on the other end. It's, it's verses like this uh, and it's seasons like this. This is how the pack gets narrowed way down when the going gets tough. That's when the pack really narrows out. And the ones that come out on the other end, though it's a narrow road, they've held to something like this. I would have despaired. I would have. I would have despaired, except I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have despaired, but I believed. I would have despaired, but I believe. And you know what you're going to have to hold to, brother and sister and whole family? Is that which you can't see yet, but you know He's promised it, and He's good on His promise. He's the only thing that's ever been tried and found true. He's good on His promise, and He says, if you will hold fast to these words, I would have despaired. See, one of the great things that everybody's testified about you is that you're hard-headed. And dismay does not seem like something that's going to overcome you. And yet, you're going to wake up in in, in a morning in Indonesia, and you're going to have to put this on. We're going to have to help them put it on. I would have despaired. What kept him from being despaired? It wasn't that he was currently seeing the land of the living. 
It was that he believed that he would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so that might be five years with two families. And you say, man, I can't see. It's there. I know what it's like to spend almost three years and have just a couple of families. And I love it. I love it because, well, I get to come and see what happens when you remain faithful. And I love it because when we're at our weakest, we can just say, Lord, I've heard and I trust you. Amen. How can we not just trust him? Look at what he's done. Look at who he is. I would have despaired. I would have been dismayed. I would have fainted. But I believed that I would see his goodness in the land of the living. Don't faint, brother. Sister, don't quit. Don't faint. Fainting is not a day of crying and seeking the Lord. You know, I have, I've had several days like that. I was finishing a particular project at my house, and it, it got overwhelming. And I just, it was close to the middle of the night. I just ran out in the bushes. I'm not even fond of the bushes at night. But I ran out there, and I kneeled. I kneeled, and I wept. And I wept, and I wept, and I wept. And I run to the bushes when I weep because I don't like for people to see me. There, that's an insecurity. Break me of it, please. I hide behind the church. Yeah. And, brother, I was on my knees. And it never, though, felt like fainting. It's there I was getting my strength from the Lord. And what separates those from... uh, who weep and fall on their face before the Lord and those that are crying is the ones who fall on their face before the Lord. They stand up and they walk right back to the task. Amen. Walk right back to the task. I would have despaired. I would have despaired, but I didn't because I believed. I believe. Nobody else can see it. You might not be able to see it. Believe that you will see His goodness. It's His goodness, right? In the land of the living. And he says, wait for the Lord. Somebody read a scripture this morning up here. Might have been Elisha. Wait, be still, and know that I am God, or something like that. Wait for the Lord. Be still. And then it, verse 14. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes. Everybody say yes. Yes. Yes, yes. wait for the Lord. Let's go to uh, the book of Galatians, chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in verse number 6. Um, holding fast, implementing, carrying out what it means that, that God has chosen you for service. That God has selected you for service. What it means that the Spirit of God has qualified you. And the validation of the selection and the evidence of the qualification is that you walk it out. Is that you put on your boots every day and walk this thing out. Walk it out. Galatians chapter number 6. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. i got a note in my Bible there. Maybe some of you would be intrigued enough to write it in yours. If not, I'm very happy it's in mine. It's in light of eternity. The, the uh, Zach and Jake, myself, and our family spent a good deal of time over the last few months praying specifically for the Vincent family. And as I, um, as I think about the things that I'll get the privilege to walk out with them because I'm traveling there with them, I think about, um, uh, number one, how can I just serve and help them? But number two, this is going to shape me. I've never seen anything like this. 
or been a part of anything like this. And one of the things that I go back to is that at the airport on a certain day, I'm going to watch them send their oldest son uh, back on the plane with me. And I think, how does a human being do that? I still got a few years with my oldest, but he's getting close. How does a human being do that? It's in light of eternity. You do it. You do it in light of the fact that this is such a short dot on the map to what's at stake for all of eternity. That's how it's done. You'll hug your son. And send him back to the United States because you have a grasp of a phrase in light of eternity. That really what's at stake is eternity. Eternity. Not the hurt and pain of the next couple of months. Eternity is at stake. And so you sow into that spirit, you'll reap it. I was hit with that lie that I had destroyed my kids' lives. I had taken them from the strongest spiritual place that I'd ever been on the planet. And I thought, man, I done messed up. Just a lie, just a nasty lie. For me, it was a lie. For them, it's a lie. It's not an uh, endorsement to step out of this ministry unless God calls you. Then it wouldn't be a lie. If it was a lie for me, it would be a lie when it hits you because he's called you. Therefore, it's the greatest thing to ever happen to our kids. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest thing to ever happen to those kids is this trip, yeah. is this leap. Because you believe in that you will see his goodness in the land of the living. I say, I say you sow in the spirit and you will, you will from the spirit reap eternal life. That's in light of eternity. Let us not lose heart in doing good. Amen. Let us not lose heart in doing good. And I really love this. Do you really love this? Yes. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, my Bible says in due time, the reason I like that it says that is because that's so different than you time. Yeah. It's due time. Yeah. And the Bible says that if you do not lose heart, Brent and Teresa, if you don't lose heart, if you can grip these promises, and if you cannot lose heart in doing good in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary, if we do not faint. If we do not give up, fainting not implies the relaxing of one's strength. When you faint, you relax your strength. Now, he flexed when I touched him there. That's not relaxed. Okay? When you relax in one's strength, and I say, brother, never relax. Sister, never relax. Guys, never relax. Zoe, never relax. Brenton, never relax. I got you, Branch. Never relax. Press and press on. And there's a night where you're crying and you're weeping, saying, hold me, Lord. That's not fainting. That's getting your strength from the source. Yes, That's drawing from that endless well, the everlasting water. The bread that leaves us never hungry. The water that leaves us never thirsty. Let us not lose heart. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who are of the household of faith. I'd like for you to flip to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 31. I got just a few more scriptures. Genesis, Exodus, and then Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, chapter number 31. We've heard this from the very opening of this ceremony today. The Rock Kazakamats. Isn't that just a lovely, powerful couple of words? 
Because ingrained in you guys is the ability to go into the unknown and know that your God is there. When Matt read 1 Chronicles 28, Wade whispered to me when he says, The Lord God. What did he say? My God. My God. And when, that becomes, when he becomes personal, there's no stopping you. I mean, what do you do with the fact that the, the presence of God has manifested himself to you? What are you going to do about that? The presence of God manifesting Himself to us in John chapter 9 when the blind man, Jesus, spit in the dirt and He he healed the man's eyes. Okay? Do you know how many people stood with that man? Anybody want to take a guess? It would be zero. His own mother and father said, He's old enough. Ask Him for fear of being removed. And I love what He says because it's the simple gospel. And when applied, and when allowed to become real in your life like I know it is in your life, you know how I know it's there? Because I'm packing up and flying there with you. That's how I know it's there. These people ordaining you, praying over you, supporting you, everybody knows it's there. We're endorsing that today. The blind man. I think it's in verse 25 maybe or something. Like John chapter 9. My translation would say it like this. They're questioning. They're asking him. What do you got to say? What do you got to say? What do you got to say? I don't know. But this I do know. Once I was blind. Now I can see. What are you going to do about that? What, What do you do about that? And. You've had an encounter with God that's led you to take leaps of faith. Keep encountering Him. He'll keep holding you. Deuteronomy is where I'll finish. Deuteronomy chapter number 31. I just want to go to verse number 1 to start. God's going to use the Vincent family. In a mighty way. Do you guys believe that? Of course. Amen. Deuteronomy 31. Moses went and he spoke these words to all of Israel. And he said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I'm no longer able to come and to go. And the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross this Jordan. It is the Lord your God who will cross ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you and you will dispossess them. Joshua is the one who will cross ahead of you just as the Lord has spoken. The Lord will do to them just as He did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when He destroyed them. The Lord will deliver them up before you and you shall do to them according uh, to all the commandments which I have commanded you. In verse 6 and 7, say something that's reiterated over the next couple of chapters. And even in Joshua 1, we hear the Lord Himself say it to Joshua. And it's powerful, and I want you to hold it. When I was talking about gripping something, I mean grip this. Over the course of the next couple of days, you're going to get prophecies. You're going to get letters. You're going to get so many things to hold fast to. And I'm saying, grip them all. And I'm saying, grip this. A little tighter than you grip anything else. Grip it. Because this is where faith is rooted. Faith is rooted in the hope to know, like Psalm 27, I would have despaired, but I believe that I would see. That's faith. This is, this is faith. He's telling him, be strong. Be courageous. Be strong. Be courageous. Be strong. Be courageous. Do not be afraid. And do not tremble. Do not be dismayed. Do not have fear. Be strong and be courageous. Why? The Bible says you can walk 
with that anointing, guys. You can go into this without dismay and without fear. And when it creeps up, you can hold to this. Don't let the fear get us. Don't let dismay get us. Why? What do we have to hold to? The Lord, your God, is the one that goes with you. Let's flash back to the beginning. He's the one who chose you. Why is He going with the Vincents? Because He chose them. He chose them. This is a privilege. Be strong. Be courageous. Do not be afraid. Don't tremble. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. And listen how this closes. Verse 6. He will not fail you or forsake you. How do we not love Him and serve Him even unto death? How do we not go the distance? You tell me one other thing in this life that offers you that. Tell me one other thing that gives you the promise that says, I'm not going to fail you. I won't fail you. I won't fail you. I won't forsake you. Verse 7, Moses called to Joshua and he says to him, in the sight of all of Israel. Okay? You realize everybody's watching? Be strong. Be courageous. For you shall go with this people into the land which the, the Lord has sworn to your fathers to give them. Brent and Teresa, be strong and be courageous. When it seems like the darkest hour is upon you, run to Psalm 27. You will not be dismayed. You will not, in the name of Jesus, be dismayed because your faith says this, I believe that I'm going to see his goodness in the land of the living. Amen. 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 If we could have our elders step forward. This body is about to recognize the ordination of Brent Vincent. That's best expressed through the elders of our congregation. When the elders accept something, certainly every other person should. That's why they're elders. Monday in this building, seven o'clock, we're going to fellowship with each other. It'll be a time of worship and prophecy. This is when you guys get to present Brent, and his beautiful family to the Lord. Right now, we are presenting them to you. On Monday, with prophecy, with encouragement, you get to present them to the Lord. And we will send them off in a manner worthy of those who risk their lives for the gospel. Amen. 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 Brent, Teresa, would you all come forward? So this is a certificate of ordination. It has been signed by Pastor Lamb, Pastor Sutherland, Pastor Piro, and Eric Stevens. We don't have a lot in this world, Brent, but our word means everything to us. And during difficult times, we want you to be able to look and say, men that you respect, that you love, we see you as more than our equal. We see God's hand upon you for this task. We want to look at you and say, you've got this. Teresa, during the inevitable moments where Brent struggles to believe that's true, your job is to remind him. To help him be the very man that God has called him to be, even as he has helped you walk as a princess of the Lord all these years. I couldn't tell you enough that nobody could have impressed upon me the kind of discouragement you face. I didn't believe it when they tried. I thought, you maybe. But I'm called. 
you will minister from places of weakness in God's power. That's how this works. And he will learn to love it. I am proud to have pastored you guys. I'm proud of everything that you've done here. And I just want to take a minute for the body of leaders right here to put their hands on you, pray, and affirm that you are qualified. You've been selected by God. You have been qualified by God. And now he is implementing you into service. And it's right that he should do so. Others have seen that ordination. It's been there since you were first born again. But today is truly a beginning of a different kind. Okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up the Vincents before you. We say that we recognize your hand upon their life. We see that they carry the ark of your presence to the people of Indonesia. But more than that, Lord, we say that their ordination should be recognized by every nation. They are of the kingdom, and they will spread your kingdom wherever they go in every nation. And many will come from them that will spread your kingdom. Lord, they will ordain others and send them into the other nations of the world. Lord, we ask for the power to crush Islam this day. We ask for the power to tear the veil away from the sons of Ishmael. Lord God, to tear the veil away from those that have been deceived by lying spirits, those who have accepted a whore instead of a bride. Lord, we ask that you would put in their mouths words of life, that their eyes would see like your eyes. Lord, that the strength of their hearing, their workings and their traveling would be in you. We, the body of life-changing ministries, we, the One Association churches, lay our hands upon the Vincents and affirm what you have done in them. And we say, let this body and all churches of the One Association bear witness today that Britton Vincent is ordained into ministry. Today is the fulfillment of a word that God's given us and a vision that God's given us in years past. That this is, as the arm of God begins to grow and it reaches across the land and reaches across the water to other lands. And so shall they go. And as they go, this arm, just as your arm, is still attached. Still attached to, to the body of Christ. To the one association. To, to this family. That just as they go and just as your arm is attached to you, so shall they be attached to you. And that we will always call to, to remember and to lift them up into prayer as God can move in their lives and using them as your extended arm, as God's hand uh, grows in, in power and in strength in Jesus' name. Uh, Teresa, Brent, uh, I want you to understand that the words that uh, have been spoken today are not just words. I want to reaffirm that this family stands with you. Yes. Our arm will stretch as far as it needs to for to do whatever it takes to help you in your ministry. Yes. Uh, we are fully committed. We are standing right here in this place and telling you that our lives belong to you for any of your needs. Yes. Anything that it takes, anything that you need from us, we're here. So please take that to heart and do not attempt to suffer through this by yourselves. We are here. Amen. The words given to you today by these men were given to them by God. These were fine words today. These were anointed words today, specifically for you. You are designed for the task. You have been groomed from birth but now the seal of God is placed upon your calling. And again, as everyone has said, you're not alone. Although you go as dead men to a place 
with people who are really dead, you are alive in Christ, and you bring the light of God with you. Their complaint is nothing. The Lord has his hand upon you and your family. We've all seen it. The power of God is upon you and your children. You will walk in victory. The enemy will fall before you. And again, you're not alone. Church, we present to you Minister Vincent. Before we put the microphone in Brent's hand and ask him to close us in prayer, I want to remind you again, tomorrow is a celebration, a prophetic time, a time of worship. I'm asking you to not blog, not bring fortune cookies. Reach into the heavens and grab hold of a truth that God gives you for them. Amen. Secondly, those of you that aspire to ministry, I'm telling you as a father in the faith, put in the work. This is not for the faint-hearted. Most that start do not finish. Those that come from the one association will complete what we have started. Thirdly, I'm telling you that we have as much obligation to support this family as we do Titus. It is no different. So this church has stepped forward and said, any shortcoming... Any shortfall, period, no matter how big, no matter how small, is our responsibility. If you desire to join us in that, mark it in the offering box. They will always receive more. They will never receive less, ever. Okay? Y'all love them? Yes. Give them a hand one more time before we give this to Brent. Thank you, family. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your promises, every promise that has come from your mouth will come to pass. Even in your patience when, you're, when the enemy begins to taunt us and to say, where is the promises of your God? Lord, strengthen us to say, watch and see. Watch and see because the day is coming where every promise will be fulfilled. Lord, I thank you for every promise spoken to every individual, every life in this church, Lord. And as we are patiently waiting, we know that day will come. Lord, this day today is the fulfillment of a promise you made to me 14 years ago, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord, that all of your promises are yes and amen. 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 amen.